Yeah, good afternoon um, to everybody. Great that you made it. It's such a bright day here to the Vienna Humanities Festival. Um, my name is Birgit Sauer. I'm from the Department of Political Science here from the University of Vienna, and I'm the moderator of um, our talk. And of course, a very warm welcome to Kata Pollitt and to Mike Vallo. And um, we will talk about powerlessness and about power. And the question is, is female to male as powerless to powerful? So, and this question will guide our conversation this afternoon. And of course, this question is a bit provocative. Maybe it's also a little bit black and white. And I hope that we can give some nuances to this question of power and uh, powerlessness. And I think we are indeed living in troubling times, troubling times with respect to gender equality. In Austria, nevertheless, we celebrate 100 years of um, female suffrage this year and next year. But nevertheless, we are also confronted with um, um, anti-feminist backlash. For instance, abortion is still a contested right um, in the US, in Poland, but also in Austria. Uh, and overall, globally, we could see that reproductive rights of women are infringed. And um, so we could see that maybe this old story of powerless women is um, reproduced over and over again. But we might also say, well, this is a little bit of a boring story, saying women that uh, women are powerless. Uh, maybe we should look into the fine grain of uh, power structures and see, for instance, um, the power of women. Because when, we, when you look at the last year, we had a rather strong women's movement against violence against women, the Me Too movement, and it's still going on. It's still um, a vivid debate and maybe also a vivid movement which might change the powerlessness of women. Of course, we have to see what's going on, but we can say is that with this public debate, women are part of hegemonic struggles over gender equality, so they are not only sidelined, but they are part of these struggles. And um, let's see what we will talk about this afternoon. So these were only some introducing, teasing remarks to our debate, and um, I'm happy to introduce the two um, speakers of this afternoon. And I first would like to introduce to, to, to you Kata Pollitt. She is a US American poet, an essayist, a journalist, and a critic. And her writings focus on political and social and gender issues, including abortion rights, feminism, racism, and welfare reform. She was born in New York City and she was educated at Harvard and at the Columbia um, School of Arts. So she's a journalist and a poet and um, in her writing she, I think, very nicely combines this um, issue of a journalist critique and um, also being a poet. So she has lectures at a lot of um, colleges and universities, lecturing journalism, but also um, teaching poetry, for instance. She is very well known for her bi monthly column, uh, which is labeled Subject to Debate in the Nation magazine, and her columns are um, edited in collected books, for instance, and I only want to mention one title of this um, collection of, um, of uh, columns, which is a title, Virginity or Death and Other Social and Political Issues of Our Time. 
and she won many awards for her columns, but also um, for her work um, and for her poetry. And uh, one of her most recent books of 2014 uh, has the title Pro Claiming, Pro Reclaiming Abortion Rights. And this book, of course, makes a powerful argument for abortion as a moral right and a social good. Among her previous books um, is the poet book, The Mind-Body Problem and Other Pro Problem Poems from 2009. And uh, I just want to mention um, one other poetry book, um, Antarctic Traveler, and this book won the National Book Crit uh, Critique Circle Award in um, the 80s. So, and then I introduce Mieke Verlo. She is a professor of comparative politics and inequality issues at the Department of Political Science at Radboud University in Nijmegen. And she is a non-resident permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. So that's why she is rather often in Vienna. Her main research fields uh, include equality policies, feminist methodology, and she's the one who coined the term, for instance, critical frame analysis. She also does research on gender mainstreaming and intersectionality in social movements. She did also uh, intensive consultancy work with a number of government um, uh, governments in European countries. She also consulted the European Parliament and the Luxembourg Presidency. She was a coach and trainer for the Observatoria project and uh, for other EU, an EU-funded initiative on gender mainstreaming. She also led two large EU-funded research project. The first was called Multiple Meanings of Gender Equality with the acronym MAGIC. And the second was Quality in Gender and Equality Policies with the acronym QUING, and in which I had the pleasure to work together with Mieke. So the analysis, development, design, and implementation of gender equality policies have been at the heart of Mika's um, research work, of her consultancy, and also teaching. And currently, she is linking the attention to strategies against gender equality and also in combination with other axes of um, privilege and power, as for instance, um, race, ethnicity, class, and sexuality. So, and among her recent publications are um, the following books. The first book, and you have it here, I want to mention is Varieties of Opposition to Gender Equality which really looks at resistance to gender equality. And I'd like to mention two other books. Uh, the one is The Discursive Politics of Gender Equality, which she co-edited with uh, Emanuela Lombardo and Petra Meyer. And the second is Multiple Meanings of Gender Equality, a Critical Frame Analysis of Gender policies in Europe. And I'd also like to mention an open access journal um, feminist project under uh, threat in Europe, where you also can find a collection of these, of her thoughts about um, opposition, resistance to gender equality. So thanks to come, for coming to Vienna and for sharing your thoughts um, here at the Vienna Humanities Festival. And I would like first ask the two of you to reflect on um, what power and powerless means in gender relations. So, Katha, perhaps you would like to start. And you have to take the mic because oh. otherwise it's too difficult to understand. 
it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, well, you know, there are, in, at least in the Anglo-American tradition, there are two kinds of feminism. There's one kind that says, women are the problem. <laughs> women have to change. Um, and here I would put Mary Wollstonecraft, who was basically the founder of modern Anglo-American feminism. And for her, women, and she was looking mostly at upper-class women, who were the ones that she worked as a governess for, and she really didn't like them at all. And she says, you know, these women are, they're so uneducated, all they care about is clothes and attracting men, and they distort their personalities to attract men. Um, and so she thought there had to be women reforming themselves. And then when they had become educated, they would be in a better position to fight for their rights um, and to be the uh, good patriotic mothers of, that the 18th century um, valued. Um, and then I would put Simone de Beauvoir in that class also, because if you read um, The Second Sex, she's not so keen on women. You know, she doesn't like their bodies. She, she sees women as being at a big disadvantage and that the most, they, maybe they could get like 95% of where men were, but there's always gonna be that 5%, you know, where, where the man could pee standing up, for example, which is something she talks about for some strange reason. Um, but then there's another kind of feminism, uh, which is the feminism of the suffragist movement. Um, where women are fine, there is nothing wrong with women. If men would just get their, their foot off women's backs, women would expand to their natural wonderfulness. They may not be as well educated as men, but they have a great deal of practical knowledge and a great deal of moral strength and every other kind of strength that you would need. And I tend to be more on that side of things because if we wait for everybody to get educated as if that would mean they would be um, more powerful, which doesn't necessarily turn out to be the truth, we'll be waiting for a very long time. So uh, in that second kind of feminism is the idea that some qualities that look like weakness and powerlessness may not really be so. Um, and the 19th century big example of that was motherhood. That they saw mothers as naturally very powerful, but the law had made them powerless. For example, in the 19th century, women had no right to custody of their own children. The man could just, the father, the husband, could just take them and go. Um, so, um, they saw that society needs to adjust Mary Wollstonecraft thought, yeah, okay, society needs to adjust, but first, women need to be worthy. Women need to make themselves worthy. Um, and so I would, the other thing I'd like to say is that, and related to this, is that powerlessness, and I don't think women are as powerless as, you know, the contrast between power and powerless makes it seem. Powerlessness is not necessarily weakness, um, because women are not weak. Women are incredibly strong. Who goes, who, 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 has, who goes through childbirth? Who is, which is the sex that if they have a cold, retires to their bed and does nothing but complain for the next week? It's men. Men complain all the time. Um, um, women just sort of keep going because they know they have to do that. Um, women raise children all by themselves, um, which is you know, a tremendous challenge, and they do it, and they do it very well. Um, and they do it in the face of all the obstacles against them, the social obstacles being paid less and all the rest, um, and having been brought up with the idea that they're not quite worthy. Um, so I would say women are tremendously strong. Um, they do not have power that equates to the strength that they have, and that is something I think that is a great fear, that what if women could expand to their natural, you know, desserts, what they deserve, then they would really run everything, and that would be fine with me. <laughs> okay, Mieke, you want to go? Yes. Hello. Yes, and there's a couple of new people came uh, in, but there are some seats, so don't, don't feel as if you disturb, so take a seat if you want. Um, ju just do that while we're talking. Um, I think I will uh, join uh, Kata in in, uh, because when I saw the title, I thought, well, you know, this title is like part of the problem. To ask the question, is male to female as powerful to powerless, is, is creating uh, a double binary system of a very classic type. 
uh, first of all, it's the divide between men and women, and there are like apparently no differences between and within these categories, but also like one is at the balance side of the powerful and the other one is at the balance side of the powerless. And um, I, I, I totally agree with Kata that the, to, to have to construct it in such a way is suspicious. It, it means that maybe this powerless have power, maybe this is a way of already telling them they don't have it or they shouldn't have it. So, so in that sense, I think it is um, a question that is part of the problem, but why do I still think it's an interesting question? Because I do, otherwise I wouldn't have come to sit here, is uh, because I, I, I see that um, this might be part of I mean, this is a broad sweeping statement. Um, this might be part of what, what I think is a re-essentialization of sex and gender differences that I notice uh, to be growing and that I also think is driven by very powerful forces. And uh, these forces are in several um, parts of society. So they're partly in the market, um, I think you, you might all be aware of the huge controversies about children's clothing and children's toys uh, as so extremely divided across very primitive understandings of femininities and masculinities where the poor boys never get to wear a, a pink t-shirt and, and, and not even a pink t-shirt with dots because dots, you know, in case you didn't notice, dots are a very feminine thing as opposed to stripes, which are a very masculine thing. So the colors, the patterns, everything has gotten its own place in the masculine, feminine world and, and is hugely marketized. And given the fact that in the Western world most families have two children, it means that the market can sell the double amount of clothes to these families. So it, the market is a strong driver of this re-essentialization, this re uh, creation of narratives about masculinity and femininity w which underpin these ideas of powerful and powerless where the girls are the butterflies and, and, and the boys are the sharp teeth. So it's not just the market, it's also sciences. Now, if you look at sciences and the, and, the, and the dominance of power between different disciplines, then political science, sociology, they have been very powerful in the 70s. They lost it. They lost it to what? They lost it to the neurosciences. They lost it to evolutionary psychology. What do all these people preach us? That sex differences are natural. They're in the brain. They say it's not true. It's just not true. If there's anyone in this room that thinks that this is true, go read the book Brainstorm by Rebecca Jordan Young who will teach you how flawed all this brain research is. And then it's also based in this evolutionary psychology that pretends that the way human beings are now is all going back to prehistoric times where the men were, what was it, hunters, of course, and the women were all collecting seeds and nuts. And, and, and that's why they are now so weak or so powerless. And uh, so it's the market. It's, it's the dominance of science. It's the Catholic Church and the other uh, churches, especially the centralized churches. And um, I see someone in the audience here who has been brave enough to confront Gabriele Kubi when she came to talk in Vienna. And uh, she's one of the big uh, people that, that promote that this idea that women and men should not be reduced to their sex differences in the stereotypical sense is uh, an ideology that needs to be fought to the bone by all the power that the Catholic Church has. Um, so it's the market, it's the neuron sciences, it's the churches, and it is the far right who sees a lot of opportunities to, to promote a particular type of nationalism that is combinable with this idea of the powerless women and the powerful men. So it's, uh, it's a big conspiracy theory that I'm now putting in front of you. Um, of course, I think it's very highly educated audience. They all know that this is not because there is 
people intentionally driving this process. Yeah? It's, it's, uh, but it's a process, nevertheless, that we can observe, I think. Can I add something? Yeah, sure. Please. So a fascinating example of all this that maybe some of you have been following is the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings into Judge Kavanaugh and uh, Dr. Ford, um, who accuses him of having attempted to rape her a long time ago. So who was strong and who was weak? Well, he's got the social power. He'll probably end up on the Supreme Court, although, I don't know, it's a whole week before, before they uh, vote. A lot can happen. She was calm. She was obviously telling the truth. She told her story in a straightforward way. She did a lot to put, it was sort of sad in a way, she did so much to put the, uh, the committee at its ease, you know, saying, oh, I'm nervous about flying, I'd love to have some coffee. Uh, she explained brain science to them when they asked her, how can you be sure that you remember this? She says, well, it has to do with the hippocampus and things like that. But anyway, she was completely uh, uh, calm. Then Kavanaugh comes on, and he's like a lunatic. Um, he's insulting, he interrupts, he rages, he, tears come to his eyes, he, uh, he, he's very upset. Um, and, so, and somehow this became coded in which the man was the more emotional person and the woman was the calmer person as she's the emotional person, and he is righteously angry. He is righteously angry because he's being you know, called a, an attempted rapist. Um, now imagine if the sexes were reversed. Imagine if he had been her and she had been him. If she had come on and started talking about how much she loved beer, excuse me, uh, um, loving beer is a manly thing. Um, it goes with shark teeth and stripes. And <laughs> wanting coffee is a female thing. Um, and um, he was so gross and insulting and hysterical. He was hysterical. One of the most sex-type words in, in our language, which comes from the concept of the wandering womb of ancient Greek medicine. Um, and I think he was the weaker person. She was strong and he was weak. But the Wall Street Journal described her as emotionally fragile. Now I ask you, who is emotionally fragile there? The person who keeps it together or the person who doesn't keep it together? I think the emotionally fragile person is the person who doesn't keep it together. And that was him. Um, so it's, it's these things, these gendered things, it's not just the way people behave, it's the way the same behavior is perceived differently. Um, the way beer means something different when a boy drinks beer and when a girl drinks beer. A girl who drinks beer, she's asking for whatever happens. A boy who drinks beer is just, you know, well, that's what boys do. It's fun. Why wouldn't you drink beer? So it's, um, I think you've been reflecting, um, Kat, that was Mika said that, saying, well, we have these binaries, and binar these binaries between men and women, between the sexes, is one of these mechanisms which produces power and powerlessness. So, Mika, perhaps yeah. you would like to jump on that too? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think also in order for this to function, right, um, because in th there needs to be a transfer, a successful transfer for, if you have a binary, a sex binary, then there need to be a successful transfer from that binary to a binary like power and powerlessness. How does that transfer work? I think that transfer works through, through this idea in society that's also heavily promoted by uh, the Vatican and other people of the complementarity between the sexes and the natural sexual or attraction between them that functions because of these exact differences. Um, this, this complementarity, this heteronormative complementarity is what is making it possible to transfer the ideas of a binary between men and women who then, I mean, they're, they're, they're really, they have to be different. No, the idea of this binary is they have to be different. You have to organize society so that they are different. And then 
and, 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 and it's good because that's what causing the attraction. We would lose all sexual attraction if we, if we try them to be the same. In, uh, but that means that if he's active, then what does the most different person need to be? This most different person needs to be passive. If he has power, then she can't have it. It wouldn't work in this binary. Um, if she's sensitive, he has to be a bit brutal. Uh, so so the, the binary, the transfer towards this binary understanding of femininities and masculinities is, I think, where it, where, where is the core of this problem and where you see that institutions in our still patriarchal societies are always very eager at strengthening those binaries. Katha, you mentioned the law in your first intervention. You mentioned the law that keeps power between men and women. Um, and um, what would you say, or what is your experience when you look at, for instance, these hearings for the Supreme Court? Um, what would you say, what is the role of the law? So Mika mentioned the role of the market, of science, of mobilization of political actors. Well, on paper, women have a lot of rights. On paper, everything is really fair. Um, so, but the law is just a human institution. And for example, you had President Trump, uh, our legal president, do, and there's a law, right, let's have the person who gets less votes be the president. I mean, I ask you. Uh, um, but he's saying, you know, well, I am sure if this had happened, this is one of his earlier interventions, earlier tweets, I'm sure if this has happened, her loving parents would have taken her to the police. And then we're hearing, and this is a big Me Too story, which is all about, all, Me Too is all about how the law doesn't protect you. There are laws against sexual harassment. There are laws that the police, you go to the police and they're supposed to investigate your claim, but they don't. Um, that's the thing. And now we have all these women uh, coming out with their own stories of, you know, why didn't I go to the police? I did go to the police. Why didn't I go to the police? Because I knew they would do nothing. Um, why, and then we have uh, cases that are now getting a little more attention than before of, okay, I went to the police and the police investigated my complaint and we had a trial and then the jury said that even though I was an unconscious patient in a hospital and the doctor had sex with me and we're finding him guilty, he shouldn't go to jail. What? I mean, that's, that's a little excessive, don't you think? Um, so there's, I think there's a sense that women really have that we're not getting justice. Um, it doesn't matter what the law says, it doesn't work in practice for us because our, our suffering, our pain, the injustices that are visited upon us are not important. And that is the message of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's just not important. I mean, why do you think it is? This is amazing, and this is also a legal thing. They, the, the Republicans on that committee are so, they're all men, they're all ancient, they're all out of, and they're not all men, but they're all completely out of it. And they kind of were, knew that and they were very afraid of a repeat of revealing themselves as the incredible misogynists they are that happened at the Anita Hill hearings. So they bring in a woman prosecutor uh, to, to question her. I mean, she's, she is the putative victim and the prosecutor is questioning her, not him, her. And so they find this woman from Arizona, a prosecutor, um, and uh, they refer to her, Orrin Hatch referred to her as the female assistant, uh, which tells you exactly how seriously they took this whole thing, right? We're just bringing her on, she's the window dressing because we, we don't want to ask any, her any questions, so we're going to have the woman ask the questions, um, and uh, it, some of them, I forget which one actually said, you know, we're going to have this hearing and then we're going to vote, and then I'm going to vote for him. Well, what, are you, what does it mean to have a hearing if you've already decided what you're going to do before? But it all had the trappings of a formal procedure um, and a legal procedure, and it meant absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. Those two women who got in the elevator with, um, um, 
blanking out on his name, oh, Flake, with Je Jeff Flake, there were two women activists who had been uh, victims of sexual violence, and they got in the elevator with me and said, look at me, look at me when I talk to you. I mean, can you imagine saying that to a senator? They did. They said, I'm a rape victim, what are you going to do about that? They had more effect. They had more effect because when he got out of the elevator, he says, oh, all right, we'll have that stupid FBI investigation. We'll postpone, we'll postpone the vote. Um, so yeah. what does that tell you about our procedures? Yeah, yeah. that was exactly my yeah. question because I, I think this, um, if, if there is a growing, let's say, opposition to, to women's rights or to, um, broader understandings of what masculinities and feminities can be, then maybe this could be a good thing, right? Maybe this could be part of that. Now gender is also on the agenda of high politics, um, that we have new mobilizations for a, for a, a next wave of feminism that will finally uh, change uh, other things, uh, not just the vote. In, uh, but then in order for this to happen, democracy has to be very much alive. Otherwise, democracy cannot really process all this. So um, I, I think what you were telling about the US is also maybe illustrative of the sad state in which democracy is in the US. And um, uh, to the degree that, that, that a bunch of, of, of right-wing patriarchal men can, can hijack democratic institutions and make them work for them instead of for the rule of law what they are meant to be for. And, and, and that, that uh, someone running for president can, can abuse all these um, perverted convolutions of democratic institutions to become president even if he didn't win. Uh, the popular vote. So, um, I mean, we, we know many of these things. We know that proportional representation is, is a better form of democracy than majoritarian systems. Um, but I, I hear very little of that in American discussions. I, I often see very much that they take this, the sad state of their institutions for granted. And I, I can see why, because probably why, because it's very difficult to change them, right? But I, I don't see, I see uh, um, a lot of women on the street for women's rights, but I don't see the same attention for, for changing democratic rules, procedures, uh, which I think is very much needed also to enable um, their movements to actually change something in society. Well, there are various ideas about how to change the electoral system, um, but they're a little cute, you know, that I, I, and they're a little hard to understand and they're kind of mathematical, um, involving states would all agree if they got, that they would go with the popular vote. Mm -hmm. But if you were Wyoming, why would you do that? The thing is the system we have now privileges um, something like 11% of the population controls 44% of the seats in the Senate um, because every state, no matter what its size, has two votes, two senators. So Wyoming, uh, which is, sorry, which is physically enormous, but has fewer people in it than Staten Island, a borough of uh, New York City, why would they ever vote to change that? This is great for them. Um, so it's kind of, and you have to, the way it's all set up, you have to get like huge majorities to change things. So I really don't know how that's going to work out. Um, but even with the system that we have, and not to get distracted um, from our subject, but, but um, there could be campaign finance reform, for example. I mean, you know, the way people, there are just a few corporations, a few billionaires and a few um, organized interest groups like the National Rifle Association that have vastly disproportionate power and everybody's afraid of them. So um, that could change. We don't need to have a constitutional amendment to change that. 
So Mika, perhaps you go back to your um, question of, of um, democracy and different forms of democracy, because if we look, a lot of people um, feel unease with liberal democracy and especially with the um, erosion and decline of liberal democracy, but they do not see the connection then to gender equality. So perhaps you would like to reflect on that. The, yeah, how could we combine um, struggles to strengthen democracy with struggles for gender equality? Okay, I have to, to, to like contextualize then a little bit, no? Because I cannot talk about the whole world and, and uh, um, because it's very different, of course, how that f f works out in different contexts. So my, my own expertise is mostly about Europe. I know something about Austria. I know something about the Netherlands a couple of other countries. Um, I think, first of all, I think that you can't make any progress on gender unless you embed it firmly, firmly and absolutely into a broader understanding of social justice. In, in the current European political landscape in which uh, almost all far-right or extreme-right parties are abusing uh, gender equality to hit mostly Muslims on the head who presumably would be against it or who presumably uh, would be the ones uh, deficient on this, uh, regardless of what, what any empirical data would say, um, you, you cannot afford to let gender equality mean anyone who's not Muslim and not Jewish and not uh, black and not uh, lesbian and not uh, whatever. So, so you have to have a broader understanding of social justice in which you embed this idea of, of gender equality. And so that, that means, first of all, that this this, you, you mentioned when you introduced me that I, I worked on social movements and I work on problems of coalitions between social movements. And I'm very fond of, of work by Krimiri Crenshaw, who, who points out that you know, all these different systems of domination and oppression uh, also create incentives for movements to distance themselves from each other and even compete with each other in, uh, to the extent that they all suffer. So th there is a true need to, to address this. And by this, I don't really mean that, uh, although I, I mean, it's part of that, I don't mean, first of all, that feminists should look at how racist they are or how homophobic they are. To a certain degree, they are. I think all people who, who grow up in Europe um, can, can't, can hardly escape some racist connotations that are so much part of our, the world in which we live. But the, the, the strongest racism is not in the feminist movement. The strongest racism is not in the gay and lesbian movement. The strongest racism is with the far right parties and some of these actors. And you should point at these enemies where they are and not, um, not use most of your energy to, um, to fight these like internal battles. You have to address them, but you have to address them in a more generous way. Uh, within the movement in order to make these coalitions. Uh, and I, I think I have a good, very good example from the Netherlands. We have a new party in the Netherlands. Um, they uh, came up right before the last uh, national elections, called themselves Article 1. Article 1 of the Dutch constitution says, whoever are in the Netherlands shall be treated equally. So you notice it doesn't say whoever is Dutch. It says, whoever is in the Netherlands. And I think that is as it should be. So they started as a very strong anti-discrimination social justice party. They're the most diverse group. They started two, three months before the elections. That's not how you win anything, but we uh, um, at the local elections that followed briefly after, they won one seat in the Amsterdam Council. So they are building up the party, and they're now called together or something um, for some other reason. So I do think that it is possible uh, to develop this type of um, political forces. And it's not that I think that they will uh, win the next elections. I think what, what is uh, making me 
hopeful or enthusiastic is that there are still people who are willing to develop this type of narratives, political narratives for the future. Like what should our societies be like? What should we want? And, uh, and how can we translate this idea of social justice to all of us? And I think that's very nice. And within that, of course, gender is part. Yeah, thanks for this um, optimistic view. So we moved a little bit from the notion of power over, of domination, also to power to act and to change injustice, for instance. And I think this is the moment where I would like to open the conversation to the audience. And there is a microphone, so if you have remarks or questions, yeah, please raise your hand and you'll get the microphone and then, okay. So I would like to ask about so-called crisis of masculinity, which seems to be uh, growing on popularity, this concept, and it uh, is to be responsible for opioid epidemic because this working class men who lost their position as breadwinners now are in pain, and it's, you know, there's incels community and other misogynistic trolls on the internet. And somewhere in this co concept, there's an idea that, you know, feminism is responsible for all that. Because if it wasn't for feminism, you know, women would stay home, where is their place, and men wouldn't be in such pain. So I would like to ask you about your thoughts on this crisis of masculinity. Who wants to, who wants to start? Okay, Mika and then Kata. I think it's a, it's a great question. And I, and I, I really, uh, I mean, I wish it was a cabaret show, right? Because I think it's really funny and totally ironic and uh, how um, at the same time, men can, can claim and know to be the powerful ones in the world and then um, go whining that women have, you know, cut off their penises and, uh, and reduced them to nothing. Uh, because this, this incel movement is very much blaming women for, for, for anything that goes wrong in their lives. So, so they, it's a sad story of men that have adopted the idea that all men should be successful, all men should be strong, all men should be able to conquer all women and grab them somewhere uh, if they have the power. And then if, if this promise doesn't happen to them, they blame women. I think that's, it doesn't make any sense. Where, where, where in that story did women do something except that they, they were not had, right? The only point in the woman where in the story where women emerge is that they were not had, right? So they're a passive object. So how can the passive object have been the reason that you didn't get things? I, I don't understand that logic of their, um, but it is, I think, a growing narrative and I think we should watch it very carefully. Actually, you wanna respond to that too? Um, yeah, I have to. I read an article recently that said that when men, this is America, when men lose their jobs and they're staying home and their wife is working, they do not do any more housework. They do not take up the tasks that, you know, so that their wife wouldn't have to do, she still has to do everything. Um, but they do one thing that they didn't used to do and that is cooking. And that's so interesting because cooking is now a kind of high status profession. Um, you know, to be a chef is a big celebrity deal. Um, cooking also involves skill and preparation. It involves people saying, oh, this is wonderful, thank you. Whereas cleaning the bathroom, no one is ever going, is never going to be that. We're never going to see celebrity bathroom cleaners. Uh, <laughs> celebrity vacuumers. Uh, and dusters, that's never going to happen. So I think that, you know, that it's really about status. And it's a, the, the perceived, by men, loss of their status um, <laughs> as the big important people in the world. Um, and um, I just want to tell you one more story which relates to this, which I read a long time ago, that um, uh, when they had, at one time, uh, airplanes were cleaned by women 
uh, you know, and they used these little vacuum cleaners that were um, that were pink and all like that. And then the, the, these men came in and they were going to do that job. And they looked, oh no, pink vacuum cleaners! This is so terrible. This is so. And so they went and got these completely unnecessary, big, really big, heavy vacuum cleaners, so that the men would feel that you know, cleaning the seat of an airplane was some big manly job. Um, and I think that this is this is a very very common attitude that um, it's it's not always even about money. It's it's about feeling better than women, stronger than women, having more uh, more scope than women, and doing things that women can't do. But unfortunately, women can do everything. So that <laughs> so it you makes, the crisis. <laughs> that's that's the crisis. Okay, there's in the second row, Mary. So um, I have a bit of a cold, but I hope I'll manage anyway. Um, you already stole part of what I was going to say because um, there are traditionally aspects of work and professions that have traditionally always been reserved for men and traditionally reserved for women. And I was going to mention chefs because we all think of women as cooking, etc. But of course, the famous chefs in the world are men. Things have changed. Uh, for example, the Wiener uh, Philharmonica have accepted women into their orchestra. In the, meantime, so, um, in the meantime, also, there are a couple of very, very good conductors who are women. Uh, we have male nurses, so things have gradually changed. But one statement or observation, I'm not going to ask it as a question because it doesn't really have an answer, is why, in your opinion, there has never been, I believe I'm right, a female president of the United States. And also in um, southern countries, such as, for example, South America, where we associate um, things like machismo, um, I can think of at least two women presidents, but in the United States not, and also in Austria not. A um, statement, an observation, <laughs> maybe an answer. Um, well, let me, let me take a stab at that. Um, I think women tend to win the presidency, the, the top job, more when it's a parliamentary system and you get to be the head of the party and then if your party wins, you get to run the show. America is completely different. We elect the president by her or himself. So the character of that person is immensely, uh, is very much on display. Um, that's what you're voting for. And also in America, I don't know about other countries, the, um, the president is the commander in chief of the army. So right there, that's very typed male. Um, so, uh, and also in a lot of countries where the woman is the leader, she's actually the daughter of the leader before, or she's the widow, um, that kind of thing. Unfortunately, Hillary Clinton had the advantage of being the former first lady, and um, but she did win the popular vote. I really think you know everything would be if if 18,000 people had voted differently in three states she would be the president and we would all be congratulating ourselves on how modern and wonderful we were. But that, there you give the, the answer. So the answer is exclusion. Exclusion is the answer. Because of discrimination and exclusion. There's many exclusionary practices in our democratic representative procedures. And many of them work to, to the point that they exclude women. And if I could just say one more thing that if you look at the women that get to be president, often they're conservative. Look at the UK, they've now had two, and they're both Tories. Um, if you look at, um, oh, I don't know, Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel did not campaign as you know, some liberal feminist, um, even though a few of her practices kind of were. Um, and I think that in the United States, it would not surprise me one tiny bit if our first woman president is a Republican. Because what, what the real, it's not that people, I mean, Sarah Palin was very popular among people who hate feminism and would count as misogynist to most of us. But they thought she was fantastic. 
They would have voted for her for president, and they'll vote for Nikki Haley for president. What they don't want is a woman who comes along and disarranges the gender order, a woman who is exceptional, like you know, Queen Elizabeth I you know, in, in, um, in England. That's fine. That's, that's OK. Well, I would like to just continue this uh, question about Hillary Clinton. Uh, I was amazed when I traveled to the States shortly after the election that many young women didn't vote for her. So many liberal women didn't vote for her. And I just didn't get it. Yeah, why not? If the uh, sort of the contrast is between Trump and Hillary Clinton, forget anything you have against Hillary Clinton and vote for her. Even Chomsky said you should vote for her. I mean, uh, anyway, so I was amazed that I met PhD students, I met some colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, and, and they told me they didn't go to vote because they didn't want to vote for her. So that for me is a big question. I agree with your analysis of you know, Theresa May and, and Thatcher and the conservative women, and it also answers the question, why are they women leaders in the far-right parties, which is also interesting. For example, Marine Le Pen or Franke Petri, she's not a leader anymore, but was of the IFD and others. So it's, it's not just the biological sex, it's obviously much more. But that question about liberal women and Hillary Clinton, I'm still puzzled about it. It's very tragic. I, th I hope they're sorry now. Uh, <laughs> um, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people believed, either consciously or unconsciously, that Hillary was going to win. And so their own personal purity was more important to them than giving her one more vote. Um, I know people who voted for Jill Stein. Jill Stein, if Jill Stein somehow was magically transported to the White House, it would be a major disaster because she's a complete nut. Um, but they voted for her to make some statement about green politics and all that kind of thing. Um, so I think that was part of it, was, it was this uh, unfortunate over-reliance on the rationality of history. Um, but I think there were other reasons too, which was they, she was judged very harshly. You know, you had all these people saying, oh, I don't like her voice. Um, it's like, and she stayed with Bill. She was an enabler of his infidelity. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, really, this is, we're talking about the leader of the free world here. Um, then also she, there were various, you know, she was seen as corporate. I mean, let's find a president who does not have to have some kind of relationship to the major economic forces of our country. I mean, I guess Bernie Sanders was going to be like that. And he, you know, I think a lot of the people you're talking about were people who loved Bernie and they, were, they, they persuaded themselves, which was not true, that it was all rigged and he deserved to win and it had been stolen from him and they were not going to reward the theft, the thief of Bernie's victory with a victory of her own. And I think it's very, very unfortunate because these were all fantasies. These were all fantasies. None of it was true. Um, and of course, uh, we don't know, you know, there was, we don't know what role the Russians played in this. I mean, it's kind of hard to believe that they played a dispositive role, but it didn't help to have them fiddling around on the internet and all the rest. So the net result of it is that the woman who got three million more votes than the guy doesn't get to be president. Um, and I think everyone who was so pure that they didn't vote for her for whatever reason has a lot to answer for. Mickey, would you go on that or? Yeah, or well. Just one small thing to, to bring us back to the theme of the session, maybe also in this way, which is that um, I, I, I don't know, uh, I, I do agree with your analysis, Kata, and I think this purism in, in politics, in majoritarian presidential systems, is, uh, that's a phenomenon, right? Uh, I, I don't know to what degree uh, men and women differ. In, in how much they are 
or act on purist tendencies. You would hypothesize that men have much more chances to be socialized into the idea that it doesn't matter if you like the guy, if he's one of us, you vote for him. And, and I think to a much higher chance, women have not come into this type of socializing training. And uh, because they've not been confronted with these real power positions that are to be distributed. So um, the higher chance is that they have these purist tendencies and that they actually act on it. Yeah. But I know none of empirical research that would say something about that, but I would be very interested because it would, what it would do is it, it would, it would uh, lay bare a mechanism in which the way things are, are, are creating a feedback loop for more things of the same. And, and this is theoretically what I'm trying to get into like as a political scientist, I try to grasp what are the me mechanisms through which uh, a, a certain power relation now uh, transfers into a power relation tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, this would be one example uh, how that could function. But you know what's another interesting thing which is related, related to what you said is that every other subgroup in America is allowed to vote for their own kind of people. And politics is organized that way. It's organized ethnically. In, in New York State, you had to have a Jew, an Italian, and an Irishman running for the top state offices. That's just the way it was. And nobody said, oh, that's, that, those people are so selfish, just voting for their own. And black people, they, they vote for white people when the white pe person is going to help them a little bit, um, or just not be a fantastic racist like the Republicans are. Um, but when there's a black person running, they're going to vote for the black person. Why shouldn't they? They turned out for Obama it, it, hugely. But women, women voting for their own is a whole different thing. Then it's like, oh, you're a vagina voter. Can you believe that this is an actual political term of art? You're, you're a vagina voter. You're just voting for a woman because she's a woman. And this is very intimidating to people because it makes them think, oh, oh, I'm not thinking politically. I'm not thinking about what, what the people actually, their, their politics and what they actually want to do. But I think if, you know, to vote for a woman over a man when they both have similar politics, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. They will see the world a little differently. I'm not talking about voting for a Republican woman. I'd never do that. Uh, but, you know, when all things being equal, to vote for the woman, why not? Um, but you'll get a big argument from people, and that, I think, is because of this fear that men have, and some women have, that women, you know, they're, they're less powerful today, but tomorrow they could be more powerful, and we don't want that. Okay. So, just one last brief question, because I would say this was a perfect last word, but there are two questions. I think we still have the time, do we? Uh, it's in the back, or, yeah. No, it's fine. Is it true? Yeah, we can start with you and then. Okay. Uh, it's not a question, but it's my observation. Men will, uh, will help men because they expect to be helped next time or voted for next time. Women do networking on the horizontal way. And they maybe note or observed, is she worthy of that? Whereas men, it seems they do it, take it for granted that they are then again supported by the man whom they have helped in how far it works, I don't know. But this seems to me the system. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. So I was uh, looking at the title again and uh, I was I could very much relate to the different fields which you pointed out of which reproduce the gender binary, so the markets, the church, science and so on. And I also thought of law and not only because laws don't work because they don't hold what they promise, but I think they also reproduce the binary actively and for example like gender registration laws, like when a baby is born it's 
it's directly registered as a boy or as a girl, or marriage laws reproduce the complementarity of gender and so on. So in the Netherlands, there's a discussion of like eliminating gender registration more and more, for example, not showing the gender on passports anymore or not registering gender in the civil registry. But the counter argument often is um, that uh, women need a category, a legal category, in order to claim women's rights. So, but by having this category, it reproduces the binary and reproduces also the, the idea that women are powerless. So I was just thinking, like, what do you think of like, how this category of women and like, women's rights and the movement for women's rights is relying on the binary and is reproduce, reproducing it on whether these arguments are legitimate or whether they are used as a, a way to actually shut down women's voices. Okay. <laughs> so it's a big question and I'd like to ask you either to go on to this question but also to wrap up. Who wants to start? I'll just say very briefly, I think more information is better than less information. I don't see who is going to be helped by sort of like, oh, how many women do we have in our country? I have no idea. Um, you know, the, the, French, the French abolished all their ethnic identity uh, information um, after World War II because they saw that uh, that was used to round up the Jews. Well, okay, but th now they don't know how many Muslims there are. And that means that they, I mean, officially they don't, that means that they don't know, well, how are Muslim kids doing in school? And, um, you know, where are people living? And all the ways that uh, the society is, in fact, quite racist are very hard to establish using data. And I think the same thing would be true of uh, getting rid of women as a classification. Also, I think there are actual ways in which women uh, are, are, in fact, oppressed and do deserve to have certain kinds of um, set-asides. Um, and I know trans, the trans activists are totally against that, but I don't think um, I don't think getting rid of gender classifications would serve women at all. Okay, it's it's a great question, and I had <laughs> wanted to bring it up at some point also because I I think it is a bit of a mistake to to understand the binary in the way you do now, but it's very common uh, mistake. Uh, because th there is a binary in the way we understand sex differences that is not biologically true. There's many people that don't fit into the exact biological categories of men or women. So there are people that don't fit in there. So at least if in the very strict sense, we would need a third category. Um, what I was referring to is the idea that we have men and women and that means a particular type of thing. It means that these men uh, are a particular type of human beings and women are a particular type of other human beings. And it erases all the differences between them. And um, in, in that sense, I think th that um, if, if it comes to, to this sex registration, I, I, would, I would go with my own city. I'm very fond of my own city. It's called Nijmegen. That has a green left uh, government for ages. It decided to abolish sex registration where it's not needed. And imagine what that was like three quarter of the cases. They were asking it in so many uh, ways. So my trans friends, they're that helps them enormously because at least they're not bothered all the time uh, with this. Um, I think to, to further trans rights, you, you can think of better solutions than to abolish uh, this sex registration. And I would side with Kata that um, it, it's not, and, and for the Netherlands surely, which is a country where we only make a law once everyone is doing it already, <laughs> right? So I, I would go with that. No, try to change society and, and, and then change the law. Other countries change the law and then society is uh, struggling and sabotaging uh, because they don't like it. Um, so, so you can only be contextual in that. But it's, it's, I think this binary between men and women that is linked to masculinities and femininities um, where it where other things like fall into that gap. Lesbians can be more masculine, 
and, and gays can be more feminine. But it's about the leeway you have. Once you start acting too masculine as a woman, you're bound to be a lesbian, regardless of what you're actually doing. So um, I, I think the, the older ideas of older feminist uh, writers, like Iri Garay, who, who uh, coined uh, concepts like mimesis, which is to playfully playfully live all these type of binaries and thereby destroying them. I, I would advocate a lot of these uh, strategies. A lot of trans people are doing that. A lot of queer people are doing that. They're actively um, destroying the binary in society by actually behaving differently, by, by uh, living their lives in a different uh, way. I think the law should enable that but I'm not seeing where it would help to, to start with, with, with abolishing sex registration. If we get to the paradise where nobody cares anymore, then we can do it. Yeah, thanks so much for your um, inspiring talks. And I think we had a whole range of issues to discuss under this label of power and powerlessness. We discussed new concepts. Um, discrimination, oppression, exclusion, binary as a mechanism. So I think we have a lot of uh, thoughts to think about when we leave this discussion. So thank you very much for your intervention. Thanks for your thoughts and for being here. Great.